Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul with RP1 series in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1. In this episode we begin with the tech tree because I realized that I wanted something and we do have some science that I held in reserve. And the thing I want is this solar panel array. And that is because it is a very good solar panel array, 1 kilowatts, and that will help our Gemini capsule a lot. So. To that end, we need to research uh, its requirement. It requires Lunar Exploration Era Electronics Research. And also, we need to queue that up as well. Hopefully, I'm not making a big mistake picking that over other possible technologies. Um, these are very fancy sciences. But yeah, uh, maybe early life support and ISRU would be good, and we actually have enough for that. But I don't think these tanks are more... Well, the service module tank is a pain. These all say non-RO, no cost, which is interesting. Uh, anyway, so that's all I wanted to do here. We have built another Hammond boilerplate, and this time is going to be launched on an Olympus rocket, which I'll talk about when it sits on the launch pad. Um, I also have unlocked, I time warped a bit to unlock the station technology, the early station technology. And so we've got two copies of our station alpha that will be built. And then Valiant D is the Gemini capsule that will dock to it, carrying our two crew. So that's what we've got going. Uh, we have two copies of the Hammond boilerplate and that's a pretty big deal that that's really expensive you can see from the rollout cost so I'm gonna start this rolling out five days and 20 hours <laughs> okay well anyway let's hope it works um, it's a bit dodgy it's a bit dodgy okay so basically this is what tooling was bound to get to basically a a Saturn one with a Saturn one style upper stage as well so these are Tank 3 balloon tanks, <laughs> and uh, these are also Tank 3 balloon tanks. Uh, I tooled a 3 meter version, and we have four of those up here. And I had also previously tooled uh, the 2 meter Tank 3 balloon tanks, and that's what we've got down there. And we've got the RD-253, so basically a proton stage down there. Uh, so instead of eight engines and eight little uh, tanks, we've got six. And uh, of course, on the upper stage, we've got a J2. And so this is all liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And it's all balloon tanks. The spacecraft is entirely inside the fairing. And this is... I'm not proud of this design. Um, but it... It gets a lot of delta V and it fits on a 600 ton launch pad with, with room to spare actually. So what can you do? What can you do? And it's cheaper because everything is tooled. Tooling a 6.6 .6 meter tank, which is the diameter of a Saturn 1, is very expensive. And I guess that's why they didn't do it for the Saturn 1. Now we do have the Saturn 4B tank. Uh, I unlocked that. Uh, it's the FASA one. But that doesn't have a good um, mass ratio. And obviously balloon tanks have a better mass ratio. And they're letting me use balloon tanks. Um, they cost more. And there's nothing to stop me. So, well, at least I don't think there's anything to stop me. We'll find out. Previously, I avoided using balloon tanks because on principle but I don't know if I am supposed to go with principle anymore with the whole tooling thing and them being their own special tank they're not merely a, a type of the pre-existing tank so I assume they're priced properly and have their proper properties incidentally uh, there's actually a girder segment going down the middle so yeah uh, Technically, the balloon tanks aren't load-bearing, in a way, sort of. Okay, on that note, throttle is up, SAS is on, and ignition. <laughs> loud proton engines are gonna be loud. And launch. I 
I actually put struts on it. You normally don't think with Kerbal Joint Reinforcement that you need struts, but with this being such an awkward assembly, I figured it was for the best. So once again, the uh, major goal of this is just giving the engines a workout, especially the J2. But we'll also see what we can get away with, perhaps landing it on this time. I believe I configured this Hammond boilerplate to be a lander. And we might actually try and set it down. This isn't the best control rocket I've ever had. I get the feeling that it could do with Saturn 1 fins, oddly enough. G-forces are a little bit high. We could shut some engines down. They're at their burn limit, unfortunately, so that's a downside. Okay, I think this is the first J2 ignition we've had. Ooh, and it almost worried me there. Okay, and unfortunately it's the lower thrust J2. Okay, um, fairings are a bit big, so we should separate them now. Ooh, not the best separation. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe I should wait a little bit later for that. So the J2 will relight to start us on our way to the moon, but it won't finish that burn. The upper stage RD58 will. And let me double check that that's properly configured. Yes, it is the RD58, which means a 10 minute burn time, right? can't really check that right now, unfortunately, but I believe so. We do have a little bit of science there, so actually landing on the moon would not be a bad thing. Unfortunately, it's really tall. <laughs> uh, that's um, probably a design flaw there. We know how that usually goes with me. I have unlocked the... Gemini lander engine, the advanced Gemini lander engine. And that means that I can replace all these little 2 kilonewton thrusters. That would be a lot better to use for everything. Okay, we are about to make orbit here. The J2 has done well so far. And we should reach orbit with about 1,000 meters per second left in the stage. Okay, 240 by 211 and 1,125 meters per second left. Okay, well, let me just ask McJeb how the transfer is going to go and then adjust. Okay, well, the details will be handed by, uh, handled by the RCS. Before I forget, let me get the antennae ready. Just two Commutron 16s. And again, uh, this is just a pro avionics core consuming 950 watts. Still not as much as uh, a Gemini cap. Oh, actually, but it's more than the Mark I pod that I actually intend to use. I only want to send one Kerbal, really. When we land on the moon. I mean, after all, I'm, I still don't have a pad more than 600 tons, so... Yeah, probably best not to overdo things. Okay, RCS. You can see our tiny little RCS ports there. With... Little tiny air and N204 tanks, probably still more than we actually need. One problem with this arrangement is that these two panels alone cannot supply this avionics unit unless it's in time warp. If it's in time warp, it powers lower. Now, the two of them can supply a Mark 1 pod. That only takes 500 watts, and they supply about 800. Okay, well, let's make sure we can sell the fuel down, and... Ah, I failed. 
this is actually not as much of a problem. And now, unfortunately, we're not at the best time for the next engine to actually take it, but it does have... Okay, is it settled? All right. It does have Delta V to it. It has enough for the transfer. Though I was hoping to... Oh! Come on, gimbal. Uh, I was hoping to use some of it to capture around the moon. And now that's not going to happen. This RCS should have staged, actually. Yeah, the reason why we wanted to ignite the J2 again is so that we'd have enough to make orbit around the moon. Now the whole matter of attempting to land on the moon is unlikely. But what we'll do is we'll place this into orbit around the moon and use it as a sort of backup vehicle. Just in case something else were to go wrong, it could give something a push with its delta V. The fact the timing is off though, I don't know if we're going to get it in, uh, to the moon in a usable orbit. That might be a problem. Well, it's been a very long burn with the RD-58, but it's capable of doing it. And it has, in fact, done it. Looks like an okay orbit for potential rescue requirements. We're probably going to aim equatorial for all of our missions, just for simplicity's sake. And so if the J2 had been able to make its second burn, we would have arrived at the moon with at least 2,300 meters per second. And that should have been enough to make a landing. I mean, when I say arrived at the moon, into orbit with 2,300. Because the J2 would have provided about 1,000 meters per second. So obviously we're going to have to give the J2s more of a workout. I don't think we're carrying any new instruments, are we? Oh, we are. The orbital perturbation experiment. That's new. And that's biome dependent. The rest are probably not so new. But we got a teensy bit of science out of it. We should retain communication at periapsis. Alright, check the engine. Alright, the ignition. And it failed. <laughs> It failed to ignite. All right, fine. It was only 67 meters per second anyway. Oh, right. The, well, electric charge is fine during time warp. Right. And we really need our thrusters here. Okay, I'll leave it in a 191 by 126 orbit because that gives us 1,000 meters per second of delta V. Though, if this actually has to tug something else by docking to it, it does have the docking port. Um, it's not going to have a thousand meters per second, of course, but anyway, RCS off, and if we go over to the daylight side, we should see it recharging properly. And why don't I just go ahead and assess whether it really fully recharges after the night time, see how legit this positioning for this craft is. It doesn't really lose. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. No problems. Oh, connection, of course, will be dependent on its position, but that's fine too. For now, it is all right, and we'll maybe it'll come into play for the moon mission. Maybe it, maybe it won't. We'll see. All right, back to space center. Okay, so at this point, we have to focus on the Piper One A arriving at Venus. And we need to make a correction maneuver because that periapsis is way off. Um, this is high over Venus's Midlands, so we are in the SOI. I decide to start building a J2 test article, basically a smaller rocket that uh, will give us more data points on the J2 instead of using it on the bigger rockets. So that will be what we launch next. So this is clearly an orbiter for Venus, and ignition, and 
we have an ignition on the AJ-10 Advanced and this is this is good it has four ignitions to give us 400 kilometers is fine might be tough to get a line back at periapsis to be honest oh no there's another Piper 1A okay right let's add this alarm and we're going to need to focus on that one well this too is an orbiter and it too has arrived in Venus SOI we weren't planning on making an actual maneuver here so we'll just plot for its capture into orbit it's coming around the opposite direction still high inclination doesn't take too much to make a loose orbit around Venus so that's good for us with the other mission we'll, we'll plot it like this for now but maybe we'll have to do the capture into orbit in two parts we'll see technically the requirement is maximum periapsis of 12,000 kilometers so pretty much any of the stuff will do okay so we'll get rid of that alarm and add this new maneuver okay well let's just go ahead and check on Beck 1 well this is a lander and so that's a little bit more complicated we also have to do a pretty major burn here hopefully the orbiters will help with communication for this lander and there's another AJ-10 advanced but we only have one ignition left with it okay that's pretty good okay what's the altitude for the atmosphere come on I think it's like 145 is it yeah 145 that atmospheric pressure is a lie <laughs> What do you mean 0.06 atmospheres? That is a lie. Uh, it better not be that, otherwise there's something seriously wrong with my game. Anyway, um, yeah, that's a big mistake. But yeah, like that should handle it. Both capture and bring us down. We'll leave this stage with it to orient it before they separate. And then it's got fuel down here. I don't know, recent experiences make me wonder whether this dish is going to explode. We'll have to remember to bring in the communitrons. But technically, for the atmospheric probe, we just have to go below 110 kilometers. So anything we can do below 110 kilometers will be fine. Maybe, maybe I should shade a little bit higher then, huh? I mean, why risk it? We could pass through it twice. We've got some fuel up here. I mean, there's nothing that says that we have to come down directly. No, but I don't want to take too much time. Anyway, okay, so this, which side is it's 18 hours, 16 hours. All right, um, okay, so back to the original Piper 1A. Okay, approaching the orbital burn now. And I'm looking at the communication lines, or trying to, but they kept, keep flipping into the wrong direction on me. And it looks like we might be better off trying to do part of the burn ahead of time, just to make sure we capture. If like the other probe, it only uh, costs about a thousand meters per second to capture. That would be a good plan. Of course, I could just uh, use Flight Computer, but I'm not too sure exactly when to switch it off. Tell it to throttle down, I mean. I mean, I suppose in theory, Flight Computer can execute a node. It can. That's an option here. The only times I've ever tried that, that did not work very well, though. Same reason MechGem sometimes doesn't do it so well. It'll try multiple ignitions and it uh, follows the node 
around a lot trying to get that last point one meter per second kind of thing. I don't know if that's that behavior is improved with flight computer. I think it has improved with MechJib over time. Checking. Yep. And the AJ-10 advanced ignited. Technically, as long as we get into any orbit at this periapsis, it should satisfy the Venus orbit contract. Okay, well, that's an orbit. We'll just wait the 10 seconds, and then I'll separate. Okay, so we got the contract. Uh, okay, separation. Vapor and... You know, that, but that's the engine we just separated, so that's okay. Up. Uh, Oral perturbation experiment is new. We've lost connection, but even if we expend this stage... Oh, I actually don't know. Would we end up suborbital? Maybe. Well, we'll just continue burning as is for now. Okay, well, I don't want it to dip into the atmosphere do I no I think it'll explode I'm, I'll shut it down since I can uh, this is a fine orbit for it to stay in I'm not gonna bother anymore with it uh, we'll just leave it be and so yep we can ignore this for the time being it will provide communication support hopefully maybe uh, it doesn't have any commutron 16 so maybe not <laughs> actually uh, I don't think that's going to be possible. Anyway, the next Piper 1A. Okay, well, let's be careful about communications again. This time, more careful. I shouldn't just leave the engine on like that. We should be able to capture and then shut down before we lose communication. If only we could get calm help from the satellite we just got into orbit, but it'll be passing by the wrong side for that. Oh, actually, the other Piper 1A is coming back around. Just in time. But still probably will be obscured. Okay. Want to see us? Good ignition on the AJ-10. And we've got a long burn ahead of us. Okay, well that's that's good enough. We have no particular requirements to get into any particular orbit. And that's under 8 hours. Fairly tight orbit. Let's do a few experiments if we can. I don't know if we've done them here before. We have. I was depressingly thorough apparently on a different trip. Ah, okay, orbital perturbation experiment is new for lowlands. And visible imaging is new. Okay, but we have to get on with the Beck probe, and that's the atmospheric one. Okay, so how's communication going to be for this one? Well, it's definitely going to be blocked at periapsis. Um, so... Let me see, do we have the sciences action grouped? Yeah, they're on action group one. So we can we can do the flight computer thing at the right time. Well, I can set it up right now, in fact. 30 minutes, that's 1,800 seconds. And now, okay. So we've got an action group that will happen at periapsis, hopefully. Okay, that is good. These are retractable. Separation. And we will deactivate the communitrons for the time being. They remain our backup 
if it turns out that the main dish explodes like it did before we can hopefully maybe pick up one of the other probes in orbit if that happens the important thing is just to fulfill the Venus atmosphere contract here does not seem to be having a great time with orienting okay we have lost connection we have entered Venus's atmosphere and we need signs from below 110 kilometers now with Mars it seemed to automatically do it once we got below 110 kilometers so let's take a quick look I think I put too much RCS on this one as well. Uh, too much RCS fuel on this, but not enough RCS power, once again. Similar to the Mars probe. Okay, well, the atmosphere is taken hold, and it's actually waiting for us to transmit science. So, oh, the main dish exploded again. I guess it just can't, I don't know what, maybe the G-forces? Maybe the G-forces. We'll check the F3 log. I should have action grouped the... Well, there's no way to do that. The Commutron 16s. I don't know if there's going to be any connection back at all. This is the probe core. It's got 200 kilometer omni range. Well, this is a good time to do science. All right. Well, let's... We can't transmit. So pressure scan and temperature scan was the only thing that got captured. No visible imaging? Well, this is definitely coming down. So good thing we armed the parachutes. We might have to bring our orbiting satellites into lower orbits so that they can communicate with this. Too bad we didn't have a Venus landing contract. But, you know, you never know. That stupid dish, though. So, any chance that something will be swinging over us at some point? Well, we're here. We're pretty close to the orbit of that one. So, if it comes around, unfortunately... Uh, it looks like when it comes around, Venus itself will be blocking it from communicating back home, but we'll see. Venus rotates very, very, very slowly. 243 days. So, yeah, waiting for rotation is not going to be a thing. Well, it's going to be a long trip down. Uh, well, weird things are happening. Apparently, it's going the wrong way around now, for some reason. I guess it doesn't really matter at this speed, but I'm not clear what's happened. The fuel tank is down here, so the center of mass is still pretty low. This isn't the fuel tank. That's the avionics core. That's not as heavy. There's still plenty of fuel and, of course, the heat shield. Didn't need much blader. So the heat shield's lighter than you might expect, but still not totally light. Well, we're sure descending through quite a lot of stuff. Um, lots of clouds. I think we've passed through the cloud layers. It's looking good, though. Still a long way from the ground. 34 kilometers, and we're not going very fast. This may end up being a very short episode due to the sheer time it takes for this to actually get to the ground. Uh. Hmm, interesting. The probe core is overheating? Somehow? Well, I guess its max operational temperature is 425 Kelvin and skin temperature is 765 Kelvin. So I guess it might be getting a little bit hot. Venus is pretty hot. I didn't think about that. Put a gold foil texture around it and think it's all nice and insulated, but nope. 
I don't know if it's gonna survive. Of course, the pre pressure should have killed it a long time ago, but... I don't think I have part pressure limits on, otherwise nothing would survive. Unless somebody happened to configure their parts properly for Venus, as opposed to stock, but... Not many people pay attention to the pressure limit on the part. Oh. Sorry, I, I missed recording the explosion happening, unfortunately. But it ha it happened, so the probe exploded. Uh, 10 G's was the max reached. Um, yeah, I think it was just overheating. Yep. Interesting. Okay, well, so Venus is not going to be that easy. <laughs> uh... Well, all right, fair enough. Uh, we still got some time until the contract is up. We've got a few more tries, but they'll all explode. I mean, uh, I think this Piper 2A is the only atmospheric one. Uh, we could try and make sure it doesn't, like, actually descend to the surface and actually skips out. Maybe keep it to, like, 110 kilometers. But we'll have to make sure that it's got communication support. Uh, but anyway, we have maybe three more years. I should probably add the next Venus window right now. 432 days. So we'll have to make a go of it then as well. Probably. Probably this is not going to work out. We need a different antenna, one that won't explode immediately once it gets into the atmosphere. Okay, well, back to Space Center. Okay, so to round things out in this episode, I wanted to do a G2 test. And so this is a simpler rocket so that we can test out the J2 for its full duration. That's important. Uh, problem is, somehow the core is upside down. Are we controlling from here? Apparently we weren't. Okay. Oh, so I guess we were controlling from one of the Atlas stages. So. Um, well, I guess it's better to uh, show this in daylight. Let me make sure. Yeah, that's enabled. What orbit we get into doesn't really matter. We're not really trying to get into a full orbit anyway. So, Dawn, and what we have here is two Atlas stages. They're the ones for the Atlas Centaur, SLV 3C slash D. And, uh, yep, it's one stage here and another right uh, on the bottom of it. And then the J2. And that's because the Atlas uh, tanks are really light. Uh, this way is a little bit more expensive than using a whole series of balloon tanks. And uh, functionally about the same sort of mass dry. But it was quicker to roll out for some reason. So I decided to go with this. It was like two days quicker to roll out this configuration than a series of balloon tanks. So, yeah. On the boosters, we have two H1s on each one. So basically, it's like half a Saturn one stage. And that will only go for a minute and 22 seconds. So we have to light the J2 by that time, and then we can let them go. It's a little bit choppy because I haven't restarted the game through all our activities around Venus and all of that. So maybe I should have, but I just wanted to get this launch quickly done. So ignition. Oh, wait, not ignition. Let's get those launch clamps down here. Now, ignition. And launch. So lots of thrust to weight ratio. But not a whole lot of burn time on these guys. So we need to get to a nice altitude so that the J2 can... I mean, technically I can light it on the ground. Uh, they gave it a 200 second ISP at sea level. Which is interesting. I mean, that's not good, but it'll work. Very choppy. Nice sunrise, though. 
So yeah, I don't want to bring this huge core into orbit, and it's just a dummy payload on top this time to reduce cost. It's a five-ton payload, well, close to five tons. So not much. Oh, by now it should be possible to light the J2. Or not. Well, there goes that idea. <laughs> That failed quickly. Oh well. So it goes, I suppose. I guess I should just check out that booster separation works nicely, because we have another one being built of these. So we can do this test again. We clearly need more data on the J2, that's for sure. Okay, separation. Well, it's vigorous, but they definitely won't be hitting the core on the next test. But yeah, well, with this sad failure, I guess I'll call it a day. So thank you for watching. hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.